A very warm welcome to everybody today uh, to this, our first uh, Big Himes Park Society talk since, I think it was February 2020, just before uh, that coronavirus lockdown, um, that I talked about the history of Himes Park from 1066 to 1910. Before I start today's talk, I'd like to say a few thank yous. First of all, thank you very much to uh, Mrs Pomeroy and uh, staff at Woodford County High who have let us use this their conference room in what is always a very busy exam season. Uh, secondly, thank you very much to the committee of the Highlands Park Society um, who put on the technical support for today and also your amazing lunch uh, that you just enjoyed. <laughs> she didn't want me to thank you, but thank you to Claire Hobson, our honorary member, who has uh, uh, funded part of today's talk. And thank you to uh, Sir Philip Warner, um, descendant of Courtney uh, Warner, uh, who is currently uh, Lord of the Manor of Hyme Benstead, and he's come all the way from Wiltshire today. So thank you very much. So Philip's to the front, but I should get on to talk. I don't know if we're meant to do anything or give you goats or sheep or. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping you're going to tell me whether I can drive goats <laughs> or ruin the thing. Um, let's start. Um, most of the slides are better than this one, but when I tell you that this map of the manor of High and Benstead um, was drawn up by Philip Plummer. Some of you will have known Philip Plummer. He was the, I think, very sort of big in the Residents Association here, and also he was the chair of the Walthamstow Historical Walthamstow Antiquarian Society, uh, became the Walthamstow Historical Society. Um, this is quite a difficult map to draw up because it is a map of the manors of Walthamstow. And I'm very sorry if you live on the Highlands Estate, which has a Woodford Green postcode. Uh, and you say to you live in Woodford Green, but actually this is Walthamstow. The Walthamstow uh, ancient parish boundary is somewhere at the top here, um, and actually the old Walthamstow borough boundary uh, follows the same lines. The school, in fact, is also not in Woodford. It is in Walthamstow, uh, because in the 60s, when Waltham Forest was going comprehensive, the governors here fought a battle to keep the school as a grammar school. Um, the only way they were allowed to do that was by not moving the school into Redbridge, but by letting the school be looked after by Redbridge. So interestingly, historically, we are actually in Walthamstow, hence this map. Let me just show you where a few things are, because it's not very clear. Um, we are currently here, uh, at this corner of, this is the Woodford New Road, north to south. Uh, this is Hyams Park. And the map, this map is from about uh, sort of 2000, well, the, the map was written in about um, the 70s. But here is Hyams Park Station, the train line. Chingford is, has been uh, sort of taken off the map, as we're very clear. Um, and this corner of the manor here is, is basically Hyam Hill. Black Horse Lane goes this way, um, and that is, that is Hyam Hill. So you can see, um, people used to describe the manor of Hyam Benstead uh, as a leg of mutton shape. And you can almost see a, a leg of mutton there. Um, so that was the manor in 2004. Then in 1850, um, it looked something like this. Again, not a very clear slide, but just gives you an idea of some of the places that I'll be talking about today. Just bear in mind these three areas. First of all, here we are at Hyams, Woodford County High. This was where the old manor house was, uh, Essex Hall, at the top of Black Horse Lane. I will talk about that later. And this green line here is also important for later on. I don't really want to have to flick back. So try and remember, if you can, this green area, which was carved out of the manor of Hyam Benstead. This is still the manor of Salisbury Hall. In the 1300s, Salisbury Hall was carved out of Hyam Benstead. Now, this manor here, the manor of Hyam Benstead, is, in fact, quite a small manor. Um, and then it was reduced further in 1303. Um, but you'll find out uh, during this talk why that all happened and the significance of it. Firstly, the manorial system. In 1066, and we start our story um, at the time of the Norman Conquest, there was a well-established manorial system in England. The Lord of the Manor managed both people and also land, um, and he also held legal and econo economic power. The manorial system started with the Romans. The Anglo-Saxons continued it. We're not sure really what the Britons did in between uh, the end of the, uh, the Roman occupation, or the Romans leaving, um, and the invasions of the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, what we know really is really from the Doomsday Book onwards, especially in this area. 
Um, there are no written records of our manor before the Doomsday Book. The Lord of the Manor was landowner of a large uh, area of land, I should say. He oversaw common land, and also as farming changed in the 1400s, the late 1300s onwards, the open field system uh, ended, um, enclosures were made, land was sold off to farmers. Um, then in the 1920s, when the land registry was set up, um, there was a clarification made in law about really what the role of the Lord of the Manor was. And the Lord of the Manor uh, ended up being a position that was hereditary, um, and those hereditary privileges were quite different to land ownership very often. And that's quite relevant for our talk today. Um, the subject of the Lord of the Manors of Hyman Benstead, as you can imagine, uh, this talk won't last for a thousand years, but stretches a thousand years. Um, it's a vast subject, and that in the talk what I, I'm going to do is focus on the characters, the men and some women who were Lords of the Manors, uh, rather than it being a talk on the history of the manor. In the last talk, in the last talk I gave, I said the history of Himes Park is in many ways a history of England. Um, we'll see from the talk today that there were many um, external events that happened in the country um, that did affect the lives of the lords of the manor here. However, in my research for this talk, I've discovered that the history of the manor of Hyme Benstead um, does in fact take us uh, to Scotland, to Wales, to Norman France, Maryland, uh, the West Indies, and also Bombay. I do hope you enjoy the talk. Um, here we have, firstly, a facsimile of the Doomsday Book entry for uh, the manor here. You can see the name Heckham, uh, the Latinized spelling of Hyam, H-E-C-H-A-M, um, and you can see here um, the name Halden, which is where Halden Road in Hyams Park comes from. Now Halden um, was a Saxon freeman. He was the lord. He was the last Saxon lord of the manor here in 1066. Uh, we know that because by 1086. Um, the Normans hadn't just invaded England, but there'd been a massive transfer of, I say transfer of rights and land. They had simply taken over property. In 1066, there were 10 villages here. There were three smallholders and there were four slaves. A very small, very small rural community, a tiny rural community, in fact. Um, the Saxons farmed on the edge of Epping Forest. And as I said, the population was very sparse. Little is known of Halden uh, because of the lack of records uh, the, Ang the Anglo-Saxons kept. Um, but what we do know is that by 1086, the manor was held by a Norman, a Norman overlord, I suppose we'd call him first of all, because they had taken over the land. Um, it was held by Norman Peter de Valognes. And it's interesting uh, to look at his birthplace and his place of death. Born in Conn in Normandy, um, and he died in Orford in Suffolk. So you think there are many Normans at that time uh, followed that sort of pattern of, of having been born, literally born in, in sort of northern France, uh, and then very much part of the uh, sort of English, well, it wasn't, called, it wasn't England at that point, English scene in, ten, um, in the 11th century. Um, after uh, William won the Battle of Hastings, uh, Peter de Valognes came with him actually from the, uh, at the battle. Um, the Normans took over large swathes of England. Essex, in particular, um, didn't have any uh, Saxons left um, after a period of literally 20, 30 years. Um, the Normans had a system of uh, land ownership and land rights. They had a very well-established system of barons and earls. Um, and Peter de Valognes, as I say, accompanied by um, William at the Battle of Hastings, um, ended up being baron of Bennington, which is in uh, south-eastern Hertfordshire. Bennington in Hearts, Bennington spelled with one N. Um, he made his castle there, so his kaput ka was in uh, Bennington. He had a Mott and Bailey castle there, and he had a number of manors. So when we read the history of the Lords of the Manor of Hyam Benstead, or Hyam as it was known at that point, um, we read a sort of a linear history very often in the Victoria County history, history books. Um, but Peter de didn't live here. Um, in fact, it was many centuries before there was a resident lord of the manor. Peter de Valognes, um had lands in Norfolk, um, Hertfordshire as well, sorry. Um, as I said, we have an image of the lord of the manor being in a manor house in the manor, but that wasn't so, certainly, in 1086. We now get to 
what we call the partition of 1235. Um, these three ladies uh, descended from the Bolognese family, uh, but the Bolognese family had married into Scottish nobility. So they were, in many ways, uh, Norman Scots in terms of their ethnicity, in terms of their customs and cultures. Um, in uh, the Norman era, it was quite common, well, if uh, there were no male heirs, for land and manors to be split between female heirs. So in 1235, and again, this is from Bennington in, in um, Hertfordshire, Norfolk, and also relating to Hyme Benstead, the land was di divided into three. These, these three ladies here, Laura de Balliol, Christine de Moor, and Isabel Comyn. Um, they were all married to Scottish noblemen, or uh, uh, um, Norman Scottish noblemen, um, and the manor was split. Now, you may recognise some local names here, um, Balliol. Uh, the manor was physically split into three areas, and just to give you an idea, one of the areas was nearest here, where Balliol Avenue is, and Waterhall Avenue, that was one uh, a sort of large house was there, again, they did not live here. Um, another part of the manor was where, roughly where Tesco's is in Hymes Park, um, and the other part of the manor, the other third in a way, was Hyam Hill. So the manor was split into three, um, but these three uh, women didn't live in any manor houses um, in the manor of Hyam Benstead. Now, um, external events. In 1265 at the Battle of Evesham, um, Lorna's son Alexander found himself on the wrong side um, and he was actually guided um, Simon de Montfort's standard bearer at the Battle of Evesham uh, and he was killed. Um, he was killed at Evesham and that was the period of the Second Barons' War. This era, sort of in the 1200s, was a time when the Norman barons, very powerful a lot of them were, they had their own armies, they were content where they, they asked the king for all sorts of privileges. Um, there was a forerunner of the, the, the Magna Carta, in fact, uh, about two decades before this. Um, and um, the, the manor was taken into the possession of King Henry III. That was the first time um, over about a 700-year period that the manor was taken into the king's possession. Um, but it was actually restored in 1274. So it came back to this family. Now, the next lord of the manor was an anglo Norman nobleman called John de Benstead. Um, I'm going to leave this up, but I'll go back to talking about um, the Battle of Evesham. Because in the Victoria County History of Essex, it says the manor was acquired by John de Benstead. Um, it's an interesting story, really, about Alexander's son. Um, he was Chamberlain of Scotland, so Alexander de Balliol, who was the son of Laura de Balliol, um, was a very influential man in Scotland. This was the time of the English Scot Anglo Scottish Wars, um, and all sorts of events occurred um, you know, for about sort of two or three decades. Um, in the late 1290s, um, there were lots of issues, and um, as Lord Chamberlain, as Chamberlain of Scotland, um, Alexander at different times sided with the English, and other times sided with the Scottish. He was actually captured um, at one point and spent uh, three years in Berkhamsted Castle in prison. Um, and when he came out of prison, his whole um, sort of clan family, I shouldn't say clan really, but his whole family, noble family, went back to Scotland. So that's really the last we hear of the Balliols. And between 1302 and 1304, they left their kibbutz in uh, Bennington, uh, went back to Scotland. And what then happened was the king, king gave a lot of their lands to different uh, Anglo-Norman noblemen uh, who were more in the king's favour. Part of the manor, the Victoria County history says, was sold. Um, the, Bennington, the history of Bennington actually says uh, that all the land was acquired. It was given, uh, I'm led to believe really, to... John de Benstead. The Benstead family are connected with Binstead Abbey. You see lots of alternative spellings of Norman names in this period, um, which is near, which was near Alton in Hampshire. Um, John de Benstead, who was the first lord of the manor here, um, he died in 1323. He was he had land in Hertfordshire, Essex, Cambridgeshire. Um, Norfolk and also Wiltshire. 
Now, he's an interesting character, because again, this is a time when the history of the Lord of the Manor um, is very much, was very much affected by external events. Um, he acquired the manor, I'm led to believe, in 1303, unlike the Victoria County history's recount, um, by, from um, Alexander Balion. He was the rector of Little Berkhamstead. I'm sure that's just a, um, a coincidence, rector of the, the area where the castle was, where Balion was kept. Um, and he, uh, he actually married. Um, he was quite an illustrious figure. He was um, somebody who spent a lot of time with the king. He was just a justice of the Court of Common Pleas, which in those days was one of the highest courts of the land. Um, he was also one of the barons who um, sort of took various petitions uh, to fo uh, foreign kings in, in Europe. Um, he was in the king's service, uh, and also he was keeper of the Great Seal. Edward II, by all accounts, wasn't a great king of England. Um, and Edward made all sorts of diplomatic missions, not just to Scotland, where John de Benson went, um, but also to Flanders at one point. And he was a keeper of the Great Seal. So John de Benson, rector, keeper of the Great Seal, justice of the Court of Common Pleas, um, one of the barons of the realm who petitioned the king. Um, he was also a diplomat. And this is a copy of the Great Seal that he would have taken to Flanders. The Benstead family have uh, their, all of the, the tombs of the Benstead family are actually in the parish church at ben, uh, ben, sorry, Bennington, I should say, Bennington in Hertfordshire. So this, these are pictures of the ben, de Benstead family in uh, Bennington Church in Hertfordshire. As I said, 1303 was a significant year um, in terms of the history of the Lords of the Manor of Heim Benstead. Alexander de Balliol went to Scotland. Um, first of all, um, Salisbury Hall was also acquired. So I'll just take you back very quickly to the first slide. Um, this section here, it wasn't sold. It wasn't sold by the de Balliol family. It was given um, to um, a, a noble family from Salisbury. So Salisbury Hall was carved out of the centre um, of the manor of Hyam Benstead. So, from now on, um, when I talk about the manor of Hyam Benstead, I mean this area here, Hyam Hill, the strip of land, um, part of land, on the sort of on the Ching side, it makes sense, of the top end of Hyam's Park, uh, with a little patch of land they had in the rectory manor in Walthamstow. So we come back now to John de Benstead. The manor passed through the de Benstead family um, until 1493. And what makes study of uh, this period of history, actually many periods of history, quite confusing is a number of people have the same names as their sons, um, a number of sons have a sort of swapped around uh, first and second names of their fathers or their grandfathers. However, we do know that the manor passed through the de Benstead family of Bennington, Norfolk, um, until 1493. Now, in 1493, um, John Rish, or Rush, um, who was um, uh, a kind of a merchant, I would say, from, from the central, from, from Hackney or from London. Um, he bought the manor from Helen de Benstead. Um, this was the time of the Wars of the Roses. Um, King Henry VII uh, took the manor into his possession, or tried to take the manor into his possession, um, but for some reason it was kept by uh, John Rush. We come now to 1503. And this is the Heron family. William Heron uh, bought the manor. Sir Giles, Sir John Heron was his son. And then Sir Giles Heron. Now Sir John Heron was a very influential courtier. And it's interesting the sort of pattern uh, of, uh, of many of the, the lords of the manor here, I wouldn't say physically here, many of the lords of the manor connected with Hein Benstead. Uh, they had very high positions in the state. And we see he was treasurer of the chamber, both for Henry VII and Henry VIII. Uh, Ch Chamberlain of the Exchequer from 1495 to 1522. He financed part of the English army. It was, these were very, very wealthy landowners. As I said, it's not, it wasn't just that the Manor of Hyde Benson um, that Sir John Heron uh, had over, uh, oversight of. Um, and he was very influential at the Cloth of Gold. He was also MP for Thetford. Uh, he was a Cambridge graduate, uh, but he was hanged at the Tyburn in 1540. Um, in fact, he married um, the, uh, one of the daughters, Cicely Moore. He married one of Sir Thomas More's daughters. 
So he had connections to Chelsea. He married one of Sir Thomas More's daughters. And when Sir Thomas More fell out of favour with Henry, King Henry VIII, uh, Sir John Heron was taken on a trumped-up charge to the Tower of London and was executed. So that was the end of Sir John Heron. Now, Mary Tudor, in that period of English history when uh, Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholicism uh, came back, there was a resurgence of that in England, uh, Mary Tudor uh, granted uh, Heron's son the reversion of the manor. But in 1566, the manor was sold to Sir Thomas Rowe. Now, we see quite a different character in many ways in Sir Thomas Rowe, um, because we started off uh, in the talk by hearing of Halden, a Saxon freeman. Then we, uh, you, you heard, we heard of the, the, the Norman conquest and the takeover of land by Normans and Norman noblemen. Um, then, uh, sort of a Roman, not just a Roman Catholic, but obviously they were all uh, Catholics at that point, um, but somebody who supported the religion that was not the king's religion in the 1540s, not really a wise choice with King Henry VIII um, in the position that he had. Um, but Sir Thomas Rowe is a very, very good Anglican. So we, so we finally get to a very established uh, part of English history where Sir Thomas Rowe, London merchant, connected with the Merchant Tailors Company, uh, and he was Lord Mayor of London in 50, from 1568 to 1569. Um, these are some uh, etchings of Sir Thomas Rowe um, and his wife here. Now, it's interesting that Sir Thomas Rowe is connected with Hackney. And in this period, Hackney was known as uh, one of the wealthiest villages in England. The reason for that was Hackney had some large, uh, sort of smaller mansions and larger houses. It was very close to the City of London, and it was in a very, very good position for someone who had dealings in the City of London and wanted to live a semi-rural life. Um, so even though Sir Thomas Rowe lived in Hackney and held the manor here, he didn't move here, he didn't establish a manor house here. Um, he stayed in Hackney, and in fact, I don't know if you know um, this building here. It's at the bottom of Mayor Street in Hackney. So this is the bottom of Mayor Street in Hackney, it was the original St John's Church at Hackney, Hackney Parish Church. Um, I'm not sure if there was a fire there. Certainly, the, the church is no more, but there is a tower. Um, but the Rowe family were so influential. And in fact, they held the manor here for a number of uh, 200 years. Um, but their lives in Hackney uh, were such that they had a, a chapel, a mausoleum really, uh, built on the side of this church. Um, it did get destroyed, I remember now, so in the 1890s um, in the fire. Um, and all that remains is uh, some of the drawings of, of the tomb. This is one of his uh, descendants, Sir Henry Rowe. So again, we've got the, an idea now that uh, the manor being kept by good Anglicans, um, people connected with the city of London, but still not resident here. Now, I put that exclamation mark, because uh, if we finally get to the building of a manor house, um, there, was, there is mention of a house in 1350, so going back to that period when Salisbury Hall was carved out. So in 1350, there was mention of a big house, a manor-like house. Um, there was a field in Himes Park, again where Tesco was built, um, called Benstitz. So some historians believe that there was a, a large house in that part of the manor of Hyme Benstead, 1590s, before a manor house was built. Um, in 1596, one of Sir Thomas Rowe's descendants, Sir William Rowe, uh, had this house built here. Now, none of you here probably are old enough to remember it, maybe one or two of you, sorry. Um, Essex Hall, as it was called, uh, was a building owned by Waltham Stone Borough Council. Essex Hall stood at the top of Black Horse Lane, just where it, so not just where it bends round to Billet Lane, but sort of some way back from that. There is actually, or there was until quite recently, an old people's home on that site called Essex Hall. Uh, there is a blue plaque on the old people's home. But that's where this um, interesting house stood. It had a 100-foot frontage um, and a 76-foot depth. So it was a, it was a sizable property. Um, nothing uh, immensely grand, um, but it was interesting because where the house was in terms of the shape of the manor, the house would have been about, about here. So right in the southwestern corner, or the far western corner of the manor.
Right, so finally Manor House, imagine um, somebody living here as Lord of the Manor, uh, that was in the 1590s. So really we're right up to 16, the, the beginning of the 1600s. Um, the Rowe family, as I say, held the manor for about 200 years. Um, then we get to a period where William Newman, Sheriff of Essex, held the manor. Couldn't find much else about him, that's why the slide looks like this, sorry. Um, a few you might think after all that uh, Anglo-Scottish history. Um, we get to 1761. Well, Anthony Bacon, not 1716 here, but Anthony Bacon, MP, lived from 1716 to 1786. From 1764 to 1782, he was Lord of the Manor of Heim Benstead. He had Heims built in 1768, Heims being the building, not quite the building they were in, but the, the, um, the, the central part of the girls' school here. Um, Himes was built in 1768 to the designs of William Newton, who was an architect from the northeast of England. There are, if you ever get time, if you're able to see, there are some lovely prints of Himes in the collection in the library at the Royal Institute of British Architects. So the RIBA has some lovely prints of Himes, and actually, if you do some Google searches, uh, you'll, you'll be able to look at them. You can't save them because they're copyrighted. Um, interesting if you have a look at the right here. Founder of, and I'm not going to try and say that word, an ironworks in Merthyr Tydfil, Anthony Bacon MP. Um, Anthony Bacon's an interesting character. Um, he was born in Cumberland in the northwest of England, or the far northwest of England. His parents both died when he was young. His father was a ship's captain. On the death of his parents, upon the death of his parents, he went to live with his uncle and aunt and some other relatives in Maryland, in New England. His uncle was a tobacco trader. And we, we get to that period of English history to do with slave trading, uh, tobacco growing, which isn't the most glorious period. Um, but Anthony Bacon has an interesting story. Not a great story in many ways, but his uncle, the uncle who, whom he lived with, um, was known as something of, if there can be such thing, um, of a, he wasn't an enlightened man because he was a slave trader, but, he did have schools for his slaves, and he established a church for his slaves, and there were all sorts of regulations. Now, I say that very, very, um, sort of, you know, I say that in a very guarded, guarded way. Um, so, Anthony Bacon um, was living at the time when uh, the slave trade, in many ways, was at its height. Um, he made money, then, from the slave trade. He didn't own any slaves himself, but he did make money um, from uh, funding... Uh, slaving ships that went from West Africa uh, to the West Indies. Um, Anthony Bacon's money um, helped in him founding the ironworks in Merthyr Tydfil. He's actually very, very influential in the, in terms of, uh, very important in terms of the economic history of South Wales. Um, he did have an impact here because he had homes built. Um, but as I say, part of his, a uh, large part of his finance did come from that slave trade, from the slave trade, sorry. When Anthony Bacon died in uh, 1786, uh, the manor here came to one of his two creditors. Things had not gone so well. All that money um, and all that investment in Merthyr Tydfil had done very well for some people, but Bacon was, was he wasn't declared bankrupt, but he uh, ended up giving, um, selling much of his land and assets to his creditors. Um, it was kept by one of his creditors, a man called uh, Biggins, uh, for a couple of years, and then the manor was sold to William Hornby. Now, Hornby has a slightly more uh, sort of uh, easy sort of story of empire to tell than, than Anthony Bacon. William Hornby was uh, a bigwig in the East India Company. He was um, an interesting man uh, because in 1771, as governor of Bombay, that was one of the big positions in the East India Company. I think the others were Calcutta and there were maybe two or three others. Uh, as governor of Bombay, he held the Bombay presidency. He built, or he had built, or constructed, I don't know if you say this, uh, something that became called, and you can Google this, it is actually gave his name to, uh, the, the Hornby Vellard. V-E-A-A, I've written up here, Vellard, V-E-A-A, V-E-L-L-A-R-D. So he had the Hornby Vellard. Now, this may not make any sense at all, so let me explain. Um, 
This is a map of uh, the corner uh, of India that Bombay, Mumbai in modern terms, uh, is built, uh, where Mumbai is built. Uh, Bombay as it then was, was a very low-lying piece of land. Uh, it consisted of a number of, of islands and um, Hornby had the idea of building causeways between these islands. Um, Velado is the Portuguese for embankment. He must have heard that from some of the people there because Bombay would have had all sorts of Portuguese connections. Um, and in many ways, he's responsible for the founding of modern-day Mumbai. Um, the city, it was only possible to build a city here because of the building of um, the Hornby Velard. In 1783, uh, Hornby returned to England. Um, and because he'd been a, a very good chap out in, uh, the, uh, out in India with a foreign East India Company story, uh, the government gave him a, a big grant of land. So Hornby received a big grant of land. He had bought this manor, um, but in, in fact he was uh, given a large amount of money in a grant of land near to Titchfield, if you know that area, in Hampshire. He had a vision in Titchfield, not quite a literary vision, um, but he built a, sort of a visionary property based on the residence of the governor of Bombay. So there was a replica, governor of, Bom governor of Bombay's residence um, in Titch near Titchfield in Hampshire, uh, built, and that was called the Hornby Hook for some reason. He built a medieval village. You can see that even though Lords of the Manor were resident by this point, part, point in time, um, his interests were elsewhere. And also he had acquired an enormous fortune, probably not just from being in the East India Company, but also with the government giving him uh, that grant of land and money. We now get to John and Jeremiah Harmon. So we're now in the era of um, campaigns for the abolition of slavery. And both uh, John and Jeremiah Harmon were Quakers. In fact, in Himes Park, Harmon Close is named after them uh, because they were both resident laws of the manor here. John Harmon and Jeremiah Harmon. Um, Jeremiah, in fact, was, was the, uh, one of the governors of the Bank of England. They were bankers, abolitionists, and also Quakers. Um, on the 24th of November, 1793, again, we're nearly up to 1800 now, the 29th of, 24th of November, 1793, um, they had a visit, not a visit, they had asked this chap to come. Humphrey Repton came to Hyams. Um, this house in 1793 was in fact called Hyam Hill. Makes the reading of, of the history of the manor quite confusing because we know Hyam Hill to be a place name, uh, an old, a Saxon place name really, from the western part of the manor, northwest Walthamstow. But this was, th this, the house was known as Hyam Hill. Humphrey came to Repton, um, they had a, a, an enormous um, um, fortune, really, from their banking. Um, and um, Humphrey Repton didn't just draw up plans for the garden at Himes. He drew up, drew up plans for the re redesigning of the house. Now, because this is a talk on the laws of the manor of Himes, I'm not going to go into the detail of this. Um, Georgina Green has given a very good talk, in fact, on not only on Himes, but also on Repton's connections with large houses in this part of Essex and also the, the design at Himes. Um, these two images are from Repton's Red Book. Humphrey Repton, again, not a lord of the manor, but he was a, a garden designer. Humphrey Repton was um, a near contemporary of Capability Brown. Unlike Capability Brown, Humphrey Repton uh, liked designing gardens that fitted into their, their natural sort of uh, surroundings. So Capability Brown would have columns and pillars in the garden. He would have sort of little temples. Uh, sort of, some of you will have been to uh, country, house, country house gardens that Capability Brown designed. Um, Repton liked to integrate the garden into its surroundings. And if you try and imagine the view at the back of the house here, if you look out from the top of the school now, the house as it was, you see across the Lee Valley, um, it would have been an incredible view. It's still an amazing view um, in, in modern-day London, but it would have been an amazing view in those days. It would have been a rural view, um, and Repton had an idea that he would um, dam, uh, sort of create a dam over the River Ching, form a lake, um, but the parkland of the house was slightly detached from the house. There, there was to be a carriageway um, down from the house. The charter road, I think, is, uh, was the carriageway, although I might be wrong on that. Um, but you get the idea. So the parkland was somewhat detached from the manor house, um, but a very interesting project. 
Well, these two images are from Repton's Red Book. What Repton did was, for every garden that he designed, he wrote and painted a so-called Red Book, a book of the design. Um, he's the only person mentioned by name, a real person, in, 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 in Jane Austen's novels. In Mansfield Park, I think whoever is looking after or in charge of Mansfield Park or the, the landowner, um, invites the, Mr. Repton to visit. So Humphrey, Humphrey, Repton, Humphrey Repton was a very influential garden designer in this period, and the Harmons, I think we could say they were fairly good men. Um, there, there is something, I looked in the National Portrait Gallery because they gave a, a number, on, on the website, sorry, they gave a number of paintings to the National Portrait Gallery, or some of their paintings have ended up in the gallery. Um, I just imagine those paintings would have hung in Hyams. This was their principal residence. Um, there is a little line um, that they, um, Jeremiah Harmon, uh, gave somebody a grant of money that they used then um, for some sort of debt in the West Indies. But largely, these two men were abolitionists, they were Quakers, uh, and we sort of move away from, I think, the sort of tainted uh, wealth of Bacon uh, to something slightly better and different. And finally, uh, we come to the Warner family. 1849 is the date I put here uh, to the present time. Um, Thomas Warner, and I'll go through, I'll, I'll come back to this slide in just a minute. So, again, another family where everyone seems to have the same names uh, sort of re recycled. Um, so let me be very careful and clear. Um, Thomas C. Warner, Thomas Courtney Warner, um, lived at a house that he had built in Walthamstow, which is still there. I don't know if you're aware of Clock House, which stands at the bottom of Pretoria Avenue. It is a, a, it's a fine house. It was, for some years, um, an office of the Cooperative Society in more recent times. I'll just say that so you can place it. It's at the end of the Walthamstow High Street and just uh, on the corner of um, Pretoria Avenue. Um, Thomas Courtney Warner lived at Clock House. Um, his brother Edward inherited um, his estate, um, and Ed Edward Warner um, bought Hyams in 1849. Um, I'll just go through a few of the, the Warners because they potentially they're the most important family in terms of our modern history in the present day. Um, Edward Warner was um, he'd been to Wadham he came down from Wadham College in Oxford. Um, his business was on the Stock Exchange. He was a barrister at Lincoln's in Field. He was a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, Liberal MP for Norfolk, Norwich, Norwich, Norwich sorry, I couldn't see my writing. Um, and um, he was thought of um, in that period as being potentially the wealthiest MP in the House of Commons. So something like, uh, not like Rishi Sunak, but it, there was considerable wealth attached to um, Edward Warner. Um, and his life. Um, they were potentially the most important family after the Rose in terms of the uh, development of the manor. We come back to Sir Thomas Courtney Warner. Sir Thomas, sorry, Sir Courtney Warner um, was born, oh dear, sorry, I should have said 1857. 1857. <laughs> Yeah, that would be other than unusual. Um, so Thomas Courtney Warner was born in 1857 and died in 1934. I was saying to Sir Philip earlier on that the, the Walthamstow that he knew and saw would have been unrecognisable uh, by the time of his death in 1934, even by 1902, and I'll come to that date, 1902, in just a minute. In 1857, Walthamstow was a rural parish. Uh, with a very small population of under 10,000 people. By 1900, Walthamstow had a population of over 100,000. So you can imagine that development. Um, so Courtney Warner um, found, was founded the Warner Estates um, in the late in the late sorry I'll, I'll go back to what I was going to say before sorry in the late 1870s or the early 1870s sorry the Great Eastern Railway uh, started building its line. To, which ended up in Chingford, was meant to uh, go all the way to High Beach. Um, there were a number of local landowners who saw a great opportunity here. This part of Essex, this southwestern corner of Essex, was changing greatly. There was a, there'd been a massive influx of people um, in the late part of the 1800s. Um, and with the coming of the railway, uh, there was the need for affordable housing. 
So Courtney Warner um, was MP for North Somerset, then later on for Lichfield. Uh, he was a companion of the Order of the Bath, which was confirmed near him in 1905, and he was, uh, was honoured as Baronet in 1910. Um, in, 19, in 1910, sorry, um, he became Baronet of Brettenham Park in Suffolk. And I'll come to this in just a minute. Um, as I said, the eight, late 1870s were, were a pivotal era. Um, so, 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 so Courtney Warner lived at Hyams. Um, Sir Edward Warner had lived at Hyams. Um, he was very well known for his um, um, for all sorts of acts of uh, charity. They were very, he and his wife were uh, connected with many local charities in Walthamstow. But he was the last resident lord of the manor. And the, the dates are interesting because Sir Courtney Warner sold off what we now call the Hyams Park, the detached piece of parkland that was the parkland of this house in the mid-1890s. Um, that was sold to um, the Corporation of London um, and also Walthamstow Borough Council put some money into that as well. As I say, he was the last resident Lord of the Manor, but he left Hyams in 1902. He left Hyams in 1902 to live in Brettenham Park in Suffolk. Um, however, it was with the Warner Estates, uh, or the Warner Estate Company, that the Warner family had the greatest influence in many ways in Waltham Forest, Walthamstow, and starting off here um, in Hyams Park. Montauk Road was laid out in 1897. Some of the half-house flats that we uh, think was being very typical of Walthamstow um, they were built as a prototype here on Chingford Lane in the late 1890s as well. Um, the Warners were very fortunate because they owned 300 acres in Walthamstow, part of Leighton, and also this part of northeastern Walthamstow as well. I'd like to show you a letter here, um, written in 1913. Um, and this is a way of, in a way, ending our talk. Because I said to you at the beginning, um, the history of Hyams Park, Hy the manner of Hyams ben Hyam Benstead is in many ways a history of England. Um, there are many characters and, and lords of the manor we've heard about today um, whose lives were, as I've said, affected by national events uh, and some sort of wider events. Um, I'll read the letter for you. This is Sir Courtney Warner writing from Brettenham Park in Suffolk. 11 years after leaving the manor here. And he writes to the archivist at uh, Walthamstone Museum at Vestry House. Dear Mr Watson, the photographs I sent to the library are made from old prints and drawings. Three of Hyams, or the manor house of Hyam Hills, the earliest from a print in a manor book, the next being from a drawing by, by uh, should be Humphrey Repton, I think, the landscape gardener, uh, and another about the uh, same period, showing the other side of the house from a small print. The picture of the clock house is from the elevation made by the architect in 1813. And finally, here we have it. Hyams is generally described as Woodford, but the house, nearly all of the park and the grounds, are and have always been in Walthamstow. I promised to see what I could get in the way of pictures of old Walthamstow nearly two years ago, but this is all I have been able to find, and I must apologise for taking so long over it. Yours faithfully, Courtney Warner. Now, there are only three pictures sent here uh, because Sir Courtney Warner sent a, a vast number of documents which are all still in Vestry House Museum. Um, I gave a talk to the Hymns Residence Association um, about five years ago it was, uh, on the, the Warner family and their associations with, with, with Hyams Park and Hyam Benstead. Um, I didn't bring Sir Philip here on false pretenses, because this is a talk obviously about the laws of the manor of, of Hyam Benstead for about a thousand years. Um, but finally, what I'd like to say is, um, when I started um, reading and writing about local history when I was about 13 years old, many years ago, um, I was intrigued that there was a Lord of the Manor of Hyam Benstead, because the Victoria County History of Essex quite clearly says the Lord of the Manor, the title of the Lord of the Manor of Hyam Benstead, um, was bought by Edward Warner, went to his son Sir Courtney Warner, um, when they went to another Edward Warner, and then um, Sir Henry Warner. Sir Henry Warner was Sir Philip's father. I wrote to Sir Henry Warner in 1984 
uh, because I was doing a school project on the history of the manor. So Henry wrote me back a lovely letter, the very grand signature of his. Um, and he said, if you ever uh, want any more information about the Warner family and our associations, their associations with Hyams and Walthamstow, please do get in touch. I set up the Hyams Park Society in 2003, 2004. Um, before, I, before the society was set up, in fact, I wrote to Sir Henry Warner. Sir Henry, by then, was quite elderly, but he wrote back to me. Um, he wrote back a lovely letter, because I asked him if when we set up the Hyams Park Society, if he would be happy, if he'd be willing to be our honorary president. And he said he'd be delighted to be the honorary president of the Hyams Park Society. So Henry sadly passed away in 2011, um, got in touch with Sir Philip. Sir Philip, who, whose family, I mean, your family moved away from here over 100 years ago. Um, and in many ways, Sir Henry's associations were more current at that time. He had been one of the directors of the uh, Warner Estate Company. Um, had been very, that company was very active until the estate was sold off to Circle 33, I think about 20 years ago. Um, Sir Henry Warner was also a president or only president of the um, Himes Residence Association, the Walthamstow Antiquarian Society. But I'm delighted, thank you Sir Philip, that uh, Sir Philip agreed to uh, help us keep a link with the Warner family and, and also Himes Park, or, 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 or as I should say, Walthamstow. Um, finally, I think I did mention to Sir Philip um, that I believed he was Lord of the Manor. And, uh, you weren't aware of this, were you? No, Sir Philip, Sir Philip was not aware of the fact that he was Lord of the Manor of I'm Benson. Maybe like one of those uh, grand Nor Anglo-Norman families, you have lots of Lord of the Manor ships. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I thought I'd better double check this. Um, so I, I did check. It is in the Victoria County history. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted to sort of in a way bring a sort of our history from 1066 right up to the present day, to 2022, um, today, with this talk. I do hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you.